Joining us for a conversation is the founder of 321 Gold and 321energy.com, the legendary Bob Moriarty. Bob, it's great to have you back, sir. Uh, it's good to talk to you. We haven't chatted for quite a while. <laughs> yes, and a lot has occurred uh, since that time. You know, the last time we spoke, four of the world's biggest banks have collapsed within one month. And Bob, depositors are nervous and central bankers, along with governments, are panicking as they try to restore confidence in the capital markets while trying to prevent a run on the banks. Audience members want to know, were these collapses isolated or are we facing a global banking system contagion? Um, you ask about three quarters of the correct question. So let me backtrack. I use this in military terms because you can certainly understand it. When the central banks in Europe first and then the United States lowered interest rates to zero, they pulled the pin on a nuclear hand grenade. So the potential for grave danger was there but they hadn't released the spoon yet they were just holding the hand grenade as soon as they increased interest rates they released the spoon and the fuse started burning but we don't know how long the fuse is so we don't know when the nuclear hand grenade is going to go off. We just know that it's going to go off. And basically what happened is the most secure investments people could make was government bonds. And U.S. government bonds could have been 140, 150, 160. The U.S. has had a bond market bull that's lasted for 40 years and investors today have never been through a bond market crash or a bond market bear if you're gonna eliminate inflation you've got to increase the interest rates above the rate of inflation so if you've got inflation six seven to eight percent you got to jack up the interest rates that's what release the spoon we've had the biggest fastest increase in interest rates in history and let me tell you why that's important okay i i printed off a couple of charts showing how much interest you would pay if you bought a five hundred thousand dollar house and you put a hundred thousand dollars down if you were paying a two and a half percent interest rate over 30 years, you'd pay 169000 in interest. So you'd pay 400000 in principal and 169000 in interest. Now then, all you have to do is go to a 7% interest rate, which is what we've got today. And the principal, of course, is still 400000 But the interest rate has quadrupled to 558,000, it's not, not quadruple, it's triple. Uh, Those numbers are staggering. Is, the point is that everybody that held bonds got killed. British gilts were down 53% at one point last year. German gilts were down, these are the highest rated government bonds. German gilts were down 23% said U.S. were down uh, 15 to 20 percent. And here's what's important. Every single institution that was invested in risk-free return, which is in theory what government bonds are, every one of them got killed. And that includes Japan, which is functionally bankrupt now, totally, absolutely, catastrophically bankrupt. That includes every pension fund in the world. It includes every insurance company in the world. 
and it includes the banking system. So there, there are people suggesting the Fed and central banks have the ability uh, to pour water on this fire, and they don't actually, what they're really doing is they're pouring kerosene on the fire. Uh, Michael Hudson, who is probably the best writer today about economics, has written a new book called The Collapse of Antiquity. And what he's talking about, you and I have chatted about this in the past, the debt-based system that the West uses goes back to Greek and Roman times. And what happens is a person takes a loan out, he puts collateral up. If he pays the loan off, he gets the collateral back. If he doesn't pay the loan off, the bank takes the collateral. Well, what that does is set up a, a ticking time bomb that eventually the banks own and control everything. So back going back to Babylonian times, there was something called the Jubilee. And what would happen is they would write off the debt every 50 years and they would start all over again because the king of, of Babylon understood that if he took the farmland away from the farmers, the farmers would be poor and nobody was there to raise the crops. Today, the World Economic Forum, and that's where it really goes to, the World Economic Forum, the rich, the powerful, and the beautiful want to own everything and you and I will be slaves. Now, a, a simple concept that nobody talks about, but it's pretty important to understand, is that if you're in debt, you are a slave. The conflict in, in Ukraine between Russia and NATO slash the U.S. is not really a geopolitical conflict. It's a financial conflict between the debt-based system and a resource-based system. Uh, I'm going to read something from Michael Hudson because it's so important. Uh, the collapse of antiquity is vast in its sweep, covering the transmission of interest-bearing debt from the ancient Near East to the Mediterranean world, but without the safety valve of periodic royal clean slate debt cancellations to restore economic balance and prevent the emergence of creditor oligarchies. In the book, he talks about revolutions and civil wars and conflicts of all sorts and bankruptcies. And he's saying it all goes back to this debt-based system. It is this simple. If you're loaning money at interest, there is always more debt than there is money. And that's such a simple concept. Most people don't understand it. But if you've got more debt than you've got money, sooner or later, you've got to balance the books and you do it either through default or some sort of jubilee. Uh, so the question about the banks is, is a partial question. The banks are going to go under the entire system, it's bankrupt. But the pension funds and Japan and insurance companies, they're going to go under too, okay? We're going to have a great reset, but we're not going to have a great reset that Klaus Schwab's going to be part of. We're going to have a great reset in which we have to go back and we have to zero the debt. And, and we're in that process now. And there's some really sick things happening, it would be really easy to conclude somebody is deliberately trying to blow up the system. A week ago Friday, the Wall Street Journal printed an article and said that there were 186 banks that were in worse shape than Signature. Now, Signature went bankrupt, and there's 186 <laughs> banks that are in worse shape. Okay, you got a big problem. And of course, Janet Yellen had come out after SVB went under, and they said, okay, we're going to guarantee all of the depositors 
What she didn't say was some of the things like the, the cocoa bonds of, of Credit Suisse, $17 billion literally evaporated and went to money habit. So uh, there will be a lot more banking failures. I, I think there's a good chance that Deutsche Bank will go under. Uh, Charles Schwab is in deep serious trouble. And what it's done, it's created enormous confusion. If you've got money in a bank, in a regional bank, over $250,000, uh, Jenny Yellett saying it's not insured and that's at risk. So what people are doing is they're moving to the major banks. But the flaw to that is uh, the, the FDIC has $125 billion set aside to insure uh, deposits of, of investors or people who uh, deposit money in banks. However, there's $18 billion at risk, which means seven-tenths of 1% is covered. So out of every $100, the FDIC has 70 cents reserved for insurance. So, I mean, if, if you don't see chaos on the horizon, uh, open your eyes because there is chaos on the horizon. Now, what you forgot to reference with the FDIC, they do have an emergency fund, if I'm not mistaken, and it has an allocation of about $650 million, so no one should panic, correct? <laughs> oh, yeah, give me a break. Uh, I, I mean, they're talking numbers. This is so much bigger than 2008. It, it's just simply absurd. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. The, the biggest stock market bubble that I have ever seen was the Kuwaiti stock market. And in 1989, if you had two sheep and a goat, uh, and, and you had a warehouse to keep them and feed them in, uh, you might have a market capitalization of $100 million. And what people were doing literally was kiting checks, and they would buy shares in, in the Kuwaiti stock market with a post-dated check. We're going to make the check good in a year. And it just got totally crazy. And the numbers, you know, two sheep and a goat are not worth $100 million. So it blew up. But the difference between then and now is that the Kuwaiti stock market only affected Kuwait. But now we've got Japan. We've got the EU. The EU had lower interest rates longer so they're actually in worse shape and everybody's running around pretending there's there's not a problem did you happen to see the video that came out a month or two of the treasury department meeting and a bunch of people sitting around a table somebody said you know if if uh the citizens if the the people with savings scouts knew this, they'd all panic. I thought, wow, okay. At least the guys at the Treasury understand that it would be a really good time to panic. So what I'm saying is the things that, that we've been talking about for years, using gold as an insurance policy, having physical gold in your hand, I mean, we're there. You know, you've given a wonderful historical um, perspective on this, but you know, as you just referenced, it's bigger than banks. We're talking countries that are going to find themselves in a, a big hole. And my question, which actually leads to a statement you made in a previous interview, where you imparted your words of financial wisdom that deserve to be repeated, in which you stated that all bubbles pop. And that leads me to ask, is this a central banker's worst nightmare? No. What could be worse for them? It's everybody's worst nightmare. Ah. You think that Janet Yellen's <laughs> the only person who's worried? Uh, strange enough, there are thousands of banks in the United States, and Janet Yellen has just yanked the rug right out from underneath them. And anybody who's not nervous about their funds 
whether it's over a quarter million or under a quarter million, needs to rethink. I mean, this is it. And everybody's running around saying, oh, no, the, you know, it, it'll be okay. Well, they said that in 1929, and they said that in 1930, and they said that in 1931, they said that in 1932, and the stock market went down 89% between September of 1929 and July of 1932. This is worse. Powerful statement. You basically took out my next question, which was, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest. How close are we to having a global reset? And I think you just answered it. It is a 10. Is that correct? Yes. And, and we're in it right now. And there will be periods. It's like being in a hurricane. I'm not sure if you've ever been in a hurricane, but you've got the winds and they come in and they tear everything up. And then all of a sudden you hit the eye of the storm, storm and everything calms down. You think, ah, this isn't that bad. And then the other side of the hurricane hits you and yeah it really is that bad here's the key the kuwaiti stock market was more absurd but it was localized okay what are the ramifications of japan going bankrupt now they are bankrupt they're not functionally bankrupt they are bankrupt bankrupt mm -hmm. okay they're just denying it and, and that's all well and good, but ha how long can you extend and pretend? How does a central bank digital currency fit into the narrative here? If you were a real cynic, and I used to be cynical, but no matter how cynical I got, I just couldn't keep up. But if you were a cynic, you could easily conclude someone is deliberately trying to blow up the system so they can put in a central bank digital currency. I don't believe it because they're way too stupid to have a plan that good. <laughs> All right. Well, you alluded to it earlier, precious metals. But for the person listening that is looking for safety, security, and possibly profiting what actions should they be taking? You've got to separate profit from security. Great, great wisdom. You have insurance on your house? Yes, sir. You want to collect? No. <laughs> you worry about making a profit on it? No. Okay. Insurance is insurance. Okay. Physical gold, silver, platinum, palladium, rhodium sitting in your hand is an insurance policy. And now it's an insurance policy against a house that's burning down. Okay. I, I, I've been calling gold an insurance policy for years. And now you can answer, yep, it certainly is an insurance policy. If you're talking about investing for profit, uh, you want to invest in, in resources, whether it's land, whether it's oil, whether it's gold, silver, mining companies. Uh, I, I believe that at the end of the day, the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Iran, uh, South Africa, China, uh, Russia, <laughs> South Africa will form, yeah. some, will form some kind of a resource-based financial system. And quite bluntly, they talk about resources, and I think it's too damn complicated. I think they'll go to a gold-based system because it's too easy to do. We're going to have total chaos. I believe that Putin understands what's going on. I believe his economic advisors understand what's going on, and I believe that Chinese do. Uh, everybody else it's pretty clueless you know and another virtue that precious metals extends to someone is that it is not someone else's debt it is basically or in essence payment in full and one of the amazing virtues of having precious metals there well there's no counterparty risk and that's the most important part about it right there you understand why counterparty risk is so important 
please expand on that for us because I know that's uh, something we hear frequently. Okay. If you walk into a casino and you're wealthy and you tell a casino you want to bet a million dollars on a roll of the dice, they will take the bet. And there are two things that can happen. You can win or you can lose. And they're happy to do that in a million dollars. It's not a lot of money for them. If you are Saudi Arabian or Chinese or Zelensky and you got a trillion dollars, you walk into a casino and tell them, okay, I want to bet on one roll of the dice. They will still take the bet. But there's only one possible alternative, and that is you lose. Because if you roll a dice, and the dice roll in your favor, the casino can't pay off because the debt's too big, okay? You have introduced counterparty risk that didn't seem to be a factor before. So if you roll the dice and the house wins, they take your trillion dollars. And if you roll the dice and they're in your favor, you still don't win anything because they can't pay off. And that's very important. It is the size of the bet that determines the counterparty risk. So a lot of things, you know, all these people talking about the Dow Jones or the S&P going down a thousand points in a day or gold going up a hundred bucks in a day. You can bet on those, but you cannot win because the counterparties are not going to be able to pay off. And nobody talks about that. Counterparty risk is far more important than market risk. And the solution for that, again, is for everyone listening precious metals now switching gears bob i invited subscribers to forward any questions that they would like for me to ask you and the response i have to say <laughs> it was quite overwhelming um the first question we have is from stephen he states i notice other channels which advocate precious metals use the following talking points manipulation naked short sales comex deliveries <clears throat> and bullion banks and limit their conversations to only gold and silver on the contrary, you and Maurice both seem to advocate a more pragmatic approach of using the ratios and expand the narrative into platinum, palladium, and rhodium, which I never hear on other channels. Thank you. Question, what is a bullion bank and why don't other channels use the ratios? Okay, so that's two questions. I'll answer one at a time. Anybody that uses the term comics default or naked short selling and commodities or bullion banks, it's a fraud, period, end of story. The reason TV preachers and politicians and financial letter writers make money is because most of them are too stupid to understand what they're doing, but they do understand if you tell people what they want to hear, they will elect you to office, they will donate to your church, and they'll pay for your newsletter, okay? Guys have been running around for the last uh, 20 years, 25 years, and everybody hates me for this. And they say, I don't believe in manipulation. And that's absolutely dead wrong. I believe in manipulation. I would say commodities broker, I passed my series seven exam, I, I, I traded commodities for six months or a year. All financial markets are manipulated. If you can't live with that, don't invest, okay? To say that, that financial markets are manipulated is about as meaningful as saying the sun rises in the east. And my response to that is no. Nope, I can't use the word because you won't let me. But, uh, <laughs> of course, the sun rises in the east. Of course, financial markets are manipulated. That's no big deal. So what was the second question? Uh, the second question was, why don't these other channels you uh, discuss using the ratios as you advocate? 
I don't know. Okay. It, 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 it's so simple. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I can't explain it. it. You know, why would you make things complicated unless your job is to confuse people? And I can name two or three financial writers, uh, very, some of them very famous, who, who deliberately confuse people. And I listen to everything they say, and I say, you know, they're not telling me anything that you can actually make money from. I think they're deliberately confusing people to get them to subscribe in the hopes of, of learning something. But I don't think you're going to. If it's not simple, you're not going to make any money. Ratios is really simple. Uh, for example, you and I were talking about rhodium oh, yeah. years ago. 2017. Now, if, if you go back 10 years and you believe rhodium was especially cheap, you couldn't buy it. Really? Okay. You could go to Kitco and Kitco would sell you rhodium powder, but there was no liquid market for it. So if you sent the rhodium power powder back to Kitco a year or two later, you didn't get full value for it because they would have to have an assay, okay? And that would take six months. But somebody came out with rhodium coins, okay? And as soon as they came out with rhodium coins, it meant you could buy and sell rhodium in a, in a known quantity, a, a, new, a known weight uh and you could invest and i don't remember what the low was you can help me out but it was like six or seven hundred bucks yes am i right you're correct yes sir okay do you remember how high it got Twenty-nine thousand. Yeah, yeah exactly if you could do that once in your lifetime you could retire and rhodium, you know, when it was twenty-eight thousand dollars, I said rhodium would be a good thing to sell now. And I think rhodium is like seven or eight thousand dollars now. And, and while I advocate holding precious metals, that's not one I would buy at seven or eight thousand dollars. Great points there, Tom in Colorado asked Bob. I noticed that you no longer talk about some junior miners that you were very positive on. Is this because they no longer advertise with you or you lost face, uh, faith in them? Asking about Novo and Labrador Gold specifically. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question and it's a multi-part answer. Companies have to do something that are clear that offer an alternative of, of making money. And Novo actually had shut their mill down because uh, they lost control of grade and there were some really severe labor problems in Australia. So uh, Novo is really back to being an exploration company, but until they do something that's gonna appeal to investors, it's not something I can write about. I, I think I have mentioned Labrador Gold. I, I put Labrador Gold and Newfound Gold in exactly the same boat. Newfound Gold is more advanced and it's bigger, but Labrador Gold is on it exactly the same trend and Labrador Gold is an absolute steal now. Uh, using ratios as as much as I like Newfound Gold and I love that company and they're going to be one of the biggest mines in Canada, Labrador Gold is a better buy. All right. Uh, sticking with stocks here, what brokers for TSXV stocks does Bob like? That's a problem. All right. Okay. It's a problem because if you're in the United States, you're really severely limited as to uh, who 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 can trade uh, the TSXV stocks. The, the ideal situation would be to have a Canadian broker, but it, if you can't get a Canadian broker, uh, I, I I don't know who to recommend. It's a problem. And here, here's why it's important. Let's take newfound gold. 
Well, I actually, Newfound Gold's a, a, a bad example because they've got a U.S. symbol. They've got a U.S. listing, not just symbol, but let's take XYZ company. That's a TSXV or, or, or a C exchange, a Canada company. They will have some kind of over-the-counter symbol. But the over-the-counter symbol is a derivative. It is not the shares itself. It's a derivative based on the value of the shares. So the Canadian shares are the real shares, and the U.S. over-the-counter uh, shares are a derivative. And why is that important? Somebody called me up in an absolute panic said, oh, my God. You know, you recommended this stock at 90 cents and it's trading at two cents today. And I looked at the Canadian symbol and it hadn't dropped. And I wrote back to him and I said, what symbol are you using? And of course, what he was doing is he was using the over the counter, the derivative. So somebody had put a market order to sell, and if you're using the the derivatives, if you're using the over-the-counter symbols on Canadian stocks, and you put in a market order to sell, you are telling the broker, it's okay to steal from me. And they will, and they'll give you two cents a share for a stock that's worth 90 cents. And actually, I'd I'm thinking about it. I'd do the same thing, I suppose. <laughs> May I interject with a with an option here for the for the the question here? Uh, interactive brokers. If you are in the U.S., it's a, it's not an endorsement, but I personally have an account with Interactive Brokers. They will allow you because uh, they're, they're U.S. based, by the way. They will allow you to make a currency conversion from U.S. to Canadian, and you can purchase on the TSXV. The exception is, is you cannot purchase a CSE nor its OTC with them. So that's something to keep in mind. There's an option. Okay. And there's a lot of good CSC stocks. Yes. Um, and I, I, I didn't realize that it's interesting that you can't trade in or the U.S. over the counter symbol, but that would certainly be a good alternative. Now, the caveat to that is though, if you're, an, an accredited investor and you participate in the financing and you have your uh, your certificate with a legend on it they will not remove it that's where you have to have that canadian uh broker all right another subscriber asks what's his opinion on physical platinum and will it go higher in the future than gold and what ratio of platinum to hold personally i have three ounces for every one ounce of gold is this a good bet? Uh, yes. Well, I, I can't answer that because I don't know how much she paid for the platinum. Okay. <laughs> that's a, for, that's for, good. Good. For most of the last 400 years, platinum has been a premium to gold. So if you paid $2,000 an ounce for platinum and, and platinum is now 900, uh, no, it's not a particularly good bet. Uh, here's the deal. In relative terms, platinum is probably the cheapest in ratio to gold, silver, platinum, palladium, or rhodium. However, you've got to be able to buy it. Okay, and I'll give you a perfect example. I've got a, a company that I store uh, physical platinum, pla physical platinum, palladium, gold, and silver with. And they call me up periodically and they've got a deal where they want to sell something. They called up a couple of weeks ago and silver was about 20 bucks an ounce. And he said, look, we got like 10,000 ounces. Do you want to buy some? And I thought this is a perfect measure of sentiment. And yes, I do. And I did buy some at 65 cents over spot, which I thought was an excellent price. The problem with platinum is platinum is a fairly illiquid market and the premiums are higher and it's not easy to get a good deal on platinum. But platinum at 
975, I think it's a steal. Uh, I think the number is 65 or 70% of platinum is produced in South Africa, and the bulk of the rest is produced in Russia. You've got the sanctions problem with Russia, and you've got an energy problem in South Africa. I, I think South Africa is a disaster waiting to happen because they're not investing in their infrastructure and they could have a lot of mines literally shut down for months. If they do that, platinum will go through the roof. But I, I, I personally think I'd rather own platinum right now than gold. All right. Finally, Nedra asked the following. Bob has spoken, of, uh, spoken to the banking system being corrupt. Does he place credit unions in the same category as they are nonprofit and are owned by its members? And the other following question of that is, is this a reasonable place to keep a checking account, not savings, for expenses? Maybe. And the reason there is understanding how credit unions work and how banks work. They borrow short and they lend long. And as long as that's true, any bank could have a run, and that would include credit unions. But... Uh, Banks have literally turned into casino and all that's free money. I, I think there's nine trillion dollars that the feds have printed since 2008. And boy, that's created an absolute monster. In relative terms, I think a credit union is probably safer. But safer doesn't mean that it couldn't go under. It's just safer than the 186 banks that the Wall Street Journal says are not safe. All right. Uh, has he heard that Japan will join BRICS, the BRICS nations? Who said that? She's a, that? Yes, she's asking the, a follow-on question. Is this, Has he heard that Japan will join the BRICS nations? <laughs> Japan's a really funny situation because... Uh, they're so deep in debt, uh, they have an enormous demographics problem. They're not replacing, they're young. They've got the highest percentage of old people in the world and the most debt. I, I think, in, and don't hold me to these numbers, I, I think the United States has something like 120 or 130 percent of GDP in debt. Japan's got, I think, 318%. Uh, BRICS, what's going to get interesting is when somebody in Europe joins BRICS. <laughs> now, I, I heard that Mexico wants to join BRICS. Uh, Japan is still playing the lapdog for the United States. The Ukraine conflict has created a really interesting situation. The, the United States created a coalition of the witless, and they brag about, you know, we've got all these countries who support us. But if you look at the total uh, GDP of the BRICS nations, the total GDP of those who support the United States, the BRICS is actually larger. Uh, Japan is following the lead of the United States, but it's not a good thing. Some things, the whole Ukraine war is just plain stupid. Ukraine is losing the war. 100% of what Americans are told about the war is a lie. It's just like COVID, 100% of what we we're told about COVID was a lie, 100% of what we're told about the banking system is a lie, and 100% of what we're told about Ukraine is a lie. The, the probability is Ukraine will be split up between Russia and Poland, and the losses of the Ukrainians have been absolutely catastrophic. It, it was such a stupid war with no point to it whatsoever. 
and it's really a conflict that the United States doesn't want any competition. Now, why is that important? Well, the United States is talking. We've had two different generals, a four-star Marine general and a four-star Army general, talking about we got to prepare for war with China. Now, I, I was in a war for almost two years, and I'll be candid. China, first of all, is not the enemy of the United States. And second of all, I can't tell you how you could possibly defeat them. I don't think we could get a naval vessel within 500 miles of them, you know, unless you're, you're talking about turning them into a sheet of glass with nuclear weapons. But why, why would we want a war with China? I mean, what's China done to us? And I'll tell you what part of the problem is. And I don't think I've told you about these numbers, but because of your connection with the military, you'll enjoy this. In World War II, there were three capital ships for every admiral. Today, there are three admirals for every capital ship. Yeah. <laughs> At the time of Desert Storm, there were nine four-star generals in the Navy, Marine Corps, and, and Army. Now there are 40. And I'll be absolutely candid. Anytime you see a picture of any of these generals talking, and they've got like 30 ribbons on their chest and they got things here and here and here and here those are all for attendance okay that's like a gold star when you're five years old at kindergarten we don't have a general that's ever won a battle much less won a war and it, it's in the empire it's declining so rapidly it's just absolutely remarkable to me but the corruption in the United States, the FBI and CIA now get to pick who the president is. The FBI had control of Hunter Biden's laptop for three and a half years. Somebody went through it and concluded there were 389 separate crimes that had been committed that he could be charged with. And Hunter Biden hasn't even been charged with jaywalking. Oh. Now, why is that important? Well, Hunter Biden was the bag man for his brother, or for Joe Biden and for Jim Biden. And while Joe Biden was the vice president of the United States, he was taking bribes to the Chinese and the Ukrainians and the Russians all at the same time. Wow. Shaking That's head. pretty damn corrupt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Let me uh, finish up here with uh, Nedra's final question. Is Bob buying platinum over silver? <clears throat> nope. What was that answer, sir? Nope. No. So you're buying silver more than you are platinum. All right. And I'm, I'm doing it because it's easy to do. If, if I could buy platinum at a good price and it was easy to do, I'd be buying platinum. However, I think buying silver at a ratio of 88 to 1 for gold is like stealing. And as a reminder for everyone, I am licensed to buy and sell physical precious metals. I welcome the opportunity to earn your business, and we do sell gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and rhodium. Give me a call if you have any questions or you're ready to place your order at 855-505-1900. That number again is 855-505-1900. 1900 uh, bob on behalf of all of our subscribers thank you for taking those questions in closing what would you like to say to the audience okay i'm really glad you did that and of course you do it every time so i knew you were going to <laughs> um, go to amazon and put in michael hudson and bring up the collapse of antiquity it's a book that he just released, uh, literally in the last couple of weeks, and it explains the debt-based system of the West and why it's fatally flawed. We are at 
the most important inflection point in world history because every country in the world is going to be affected by the change from a debt-based system to a resource-based system. It's going to be a time of wonderful opportunity, but it's also going to be a time of terrible risk. And I highly encourage people to, to read the book so they understand why the debt-based system is so dangerous to everything. And, and actually, uh, the World Economic Forum it wants the rest of us to be slaves because they intend to own everything. And um, I'm just flat going to tell you that's the most dangerous thing I've ever heard. Hey, Bob, by chance, is the copy of the book there in your hand? Can you show us a cover of it if you have it? Hold that up. All right. We got it. Roger that, sir. All right, Mr. Moriarty. It's been an absolute delight to speak with you. Wishing you the absolute best, sir. Thank you. It's always fun talking to you, Maurice. Good questions. And I highly encourage anyone, uh, do write in and ask your questions. And I'm happy to. I'm more interested in knowing what investors want to talk about than listening to myself. I get to listen to myself all the time. That's, that gets boring. <laughs> but we love listening to you, Bob. <laughs> All right, sir. Take care. Okay. Thanks, sir. Bye-bye. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.